Hello and welcome to episode 164 of Page One, the Writer's Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to talk to writers about their writing process, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. And uh, we've got a great back catalogue of guests. Just last week we were speaking with the brilliant Nick Harkaway. Uh, and this week we have a screenwriter turned novelist. Yeah, but this week we're chatting with Cole Haddon, who, uh, as Margot says, starts off as a, as a journalist. No, it's not what you said. You said a screenwriter. <laughs> did. Yeah, he did start off as a journalist. journalist. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then he moved to LA to pursue his dream of being a scriptwriter, which is, I think, at that time anyway, you had to kind of be in that neck of the woods to kind of get your foot in the door um and and he had some success he had he, he got a bunch of stuff uh commissioned uh dracula for nbc and sky it was his big kind of debut show that he sold and as you'll hear it's a bit of a nightmare of a was it quite the dream show he was hoping it would be i don't think yeah i think it, it is a cautionary tale for those that want to work in hollywood really yeah. Um, and he he's obviously he he writes a brilliant um sort of blog or, or Substack about yeah. his experiences on Dracula, but also just generally about writing, about working in the industry and stuff. So it's definitely worth checking that out. We'll put a link in the podcast description to that. But um, yeah, really interesting speaking to him, spe- talking to him about why he moved to write this novel in particular, which is a very ambitious novel, Sam's for the End of the World, um, and and you know, the differences between the two processes and the differences in the editing process as well, which is very, very different, I think, you know, getting editor's notes compared to what he was dealing with on shows like Dracula and things like that. Um, So we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat. For now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, Every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, when I was a teenager, I think that manifested initially uh, uh, as storytelling, uh, and it, it's still that's still how I primarily describe myself as a storyteller. The the way I do that um, can change. Uh, as a teenager, I wanted to be an illustrator of, of graphic novels, uh, and I spent six, seven years very committed to that before I realized it would always take me four months to do what other writers took a month to do. <laughs> uh, and so uh, from there, it, it just became very evident that film and uh, and fiction were going to be my home. Uh, but it's... I, 
I don't have memories of myself thinking about anything other than telling stories. And and you you went into the path which I think a lot of writers do, which is uh, became a journalist after university, um, which allows you to do the writing, I suppose, in some form. Um, were you were you also writing fiction at that point as well? Uh, so the becoming a journalist was just a way to pay uh, my bills, uh, as you suggested, but it uh, it was also a way to get to Los Angeles. Uh, and so I, I, I went to uni and uh, did the whole creative writing degree uh, and was writing short stories, had some success, but it just it was taking forever and it was uh, quite a torturous process. Uh, so I manufactured a a resume CV that said I was a successful <laughs> film and music journalist uh, and nobody ever questioned me. I, it also came with a new surname, uh, Haddon is, is not my birth name, uh, and nobody ever thought to ask whether anything on it was true. Uh, and within three months, I was making enough money to to move to L.A. And uh, yeah, my, my first interview in L.A. was sitting down with uh, Tarantino. It was oh, wow. nobody ever said but who are you? It just <laughs> worked out. Uh, and so that, yeah, that, but that, that experience was amazing because I was making five cents to 25 cents U S uh, a word. And, and so I had to transcribe interviews, sometimes writing 25 hours at a time just to make that money. Uh, mm -hmm. and so it, it, it broke me of any sense of, of writer's block. That was a luxury, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, and it uh, it really taught me how to listen to people and how they speak uh, and how that changes uh, even between uh, you know very short distances really. Mm -hmm. And 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 obviously you were moving to LA was a big important step for you because you wanted to get into the world of writing for for film. Is that is that right? Y yes, yes. I, well, I I grew up in Detroit. I'm half Australian and half uh, American, uh, but grew up in Detroit, which it's it's artistic heyday had largely passed outside of very specific um, aspects of the music industry, which basically meant people like Kid Rock uh, at the time. So nothing I, I wanted anything to do with. Uh, <laughs> uh, L.A., was a more manageable urban environment, someplace that might give me some, uh, I guess, excitement uh, in life. And it had the uh, the film and television industry, which is what I think I was working out at that point was probably the majority of, I guess, I guess my my creative heart. It's it's what at that time at least I wanted most. And and how difficult was it then? So so you move out there with the with the fake resume you, you, you get the job as the as the journalist but how difficult was it then to sort of get your foot in the door in terms of actually screenwriting and things like that yeah well uh getting the foot in the door is unbelievably hard so i slept my way into the business uh my my now wife uh was a producer uh and so uh it, it works both ways uh so <laughs> Uh, no, and she she took me to a party uh, at at a house for what is now my uh, that that was owned by uh, who is now my sister in law, uh, and her manager uh, was a very successful, I guess lit manager, and he suggested reading me, and that that set everything in motion. It was a much different time in Los Angeles. People could actually get repped now. It's even people with reps are often uh, they find it difficult to to keep them or have them do anything uh, for them. The industry's changed uh, substantially. I, I've 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 literally never been able to get somebody repped in my life. Friends who I think are brilliant, uh, nobody will read them anymore. So I think I entered the business at at a very key time, mm -hmm. or I guess the 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 last gasp of a functional Hollywood before the uh, the the tech bros and streamers and whatnot took over. And I mean, what sort of stuff when you were you writing when you when you were out here, you know, because I know was it Warner Brothers commissioned your first script, but what was you, what kind of, you know, how many attempts did it take for you to get that script out there? And what kind of genres were you, were you trying anything just trying to get notice or were you focused on one type of script? 
Uh, so when I, 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 I have n no specific type of projects that I, I work on. I don't have uh, a genre I, I prefer. I don't care whether it's drama or, or comedy. I mostly just have stories I want to tell and I look for a vehicle for that. Uh, but breaking into the business was much different. I, I had written many scripts, none of which were the ones that I used to ultimately get repped. They were to, I guess, develop my voice. Uh, I wrote a spec script, a speculative script, um, adapting uh, King Solomon's Minds. Uh, and that was the, the script that got me my rep, but I was, uh, I mean, it got me a lot of attention too, but I was told, oh, the, uh, the industry uh, doesn't really like period action venture. Uh, and despite that, I went out uh, and pitched uh, another period idea um, after I had my representation, my reps told me, don't pitch that. That will never sell. <laughs> it's a waste of time. Uh, they don't want the, these kinds of things. Uh, but the amazing thing about that period of time that you don't realize when you're in it, but uh, shortly afterward, it, it became apparent. I was at a zeitgeist moment because Sherlock Holmes had just come out and was a huge hit. Uh, and Pirates, the sequel, had just crossed a billion dollars, which was unheard of in Hollywood. So suddenly, period action venture looked exciting. So my uh, my my first sale was uh, uh, a reimagining of of uh, Arabian Nights, The Thieves of Baghdad, uh, and then the next project was uh, a sequel to Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, and. Uh, the next project after that uh, was uh, a sequel to Oliver and Twist with them all grown up. So there was this moment in time where everybody wanted period action venture. I think most people in Hollywood didn't really care about it in terms of screenwriters. That wasn't their background. And I did. It was just my childhood. So I was just by dumb luck <laughs> positioned to sell a lot of these uh, loosely IP driven properties that eventually uh, slowly uh, eradicated my will to write and <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my passion for screenwriting. Uh, I mean, uh, I suppose was, was what led on to Dracula in the same vein? Was it because you were writing these period pieces that, that uh, Dracula became a thing? Yeah, no, that's that's exactly what happened. I my second script uh, was called Hyde, the the Doctor Jekyll Mister Hyde sequel. It got me on the blacklist, which is sort of a, a sexy list of uh, uh, best unproduced screenplays every year according to producers. Uh, and it it got me a a meeting. Uh, I didn't understand at the time, but they they specifically had something they wanted to pitch to me, and that that was. Uh, at least the idea of Dracula or the arena, um, and uh, and then that that just sort of took off from there. And it's, I mean, you've written a number of really interesting articles about your time on that show, and I suppose it's safe to say that it wasn't an, a very nice experience in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, and is it, would you like to like elaborate a little bit on on what your experience was like on that show? It's 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 certainly an incredibly long story. So uh, it's <laughs> almost the length of, of your podcast. So I won't go into all of the details, uh, but it, it was easily the worst creative experience uh, of my life. I was at odds with one of uh, the producers from the start. Uh, the nonstop conflict. Uh, I, I asked to quit my show several times and wasn't allowed to by NBC by elements at NBC who were, uh, I, I just still don't understand why, but they were quite loyal to me and the idea of me and, and what I brought to the project and didn't want to see me ruin my career. But the consequence of them protecting me, I guess, from my my own uh, stupidity uh, of running from, my, from a, a, a lucrative job uh, was that uh, it, it, it broke me quite seriously uh, emotionally I, I i spent a lot of the uh the development and writers room just laying in my my bedroom staring at the ceiling in the dark uh praying for it to be over soon uh so it uh yeah just uh i mean there are many aspects of it that i i loved specifically the writers room i i acquired some of the the best friends of my life uh in the experience uh but but there were 
there there were human beings involved that uh, did not uh yeah did, were, were 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 deeply unpleasant to work with <laughs> and is that is that what drove you back to novel writing essentially that you don't have to deal with people like that always sticking that poor in that right. was a slower burn because I, I I did hope to follow up Dracula with uh with another TV series and Hollywood is a brutal place where you can develop I've sold a lot of shows and and films in LA uh, and that those things die I think I don't know what the statistic is today but when I arrived in Hollywood it was roughly five percent of development ever actually got produced and mm-hmm. so uh, it was a spectacular miracle that my fourth project uh, was greenlit to series. That mm-hmm. that that's a st- statistical anomaly, uh, and and so I I I sought to uh, follow it up with some series that were more personal to me that uh, that I I cared about more and uh, and all sorts of strange things from uh, studios shuttering to being bought uh, in the middle of me working, uh, you know, periodically kneecapped those adventures. Uh, and then the the novel write, writing uh, grew out of the fact that after the 2016 election, uh, my family fled America. We, we sold our house and just uh, moved to the UK. Uh, and I lasted about six months, seven months uh, watching Brexit sort of eat the country, uh, uh, you know, divide the country, uh, while simultaneously Trump was burning down America. My mother had just died and my father uh, found out that uh, uh, he had um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis and if he didn't get a double lung transplant, he would die. And so there was just, hear that. Hey, well, he ultimately died, thank you. Uh, but he he made it through that, that stretch, which at least was a relief. We had more time with him. But in the middle of that, uh, I had uh, uh, my second son. Uh, and so that, I think, broke something open in me. I was just a little bit lost and I needed a way to, um, I guess, explore that or expunge some of it from myself. And I had been thinking about this book for about 20 years. Uh, and so nine days after my second son was born at 3 a.m. in the morning with him still strapped to me, I started writing uh, just to see if I could still do it. It had been a while since I wrote prose uh, and Hollywood or screen screenwriting will break you of things like sentences. Uh, they, <laughs> they, they, it's just there. They, screenplays don't want uh, lovely sentences yeah. or anything like that. Uh, I, I always it, it describes screenwriting the way that you have to write prose in a script is a is akin to Ernest Hemingway after a head injury or a, a week of hard drinking. It's just, you know, it's just it's it's staccato nonsense. Um and, and so I, I started writing. I couldn't stop and uh and didn't stop for six months, in fact. So the book that you wrote was uh, Sam's for the end of the world. Was that the one mm. that you that you started writing? And do you want yes. to tell tell us a bit about that? Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly can. Uh, so you know, at, at its heart, uh, I guess I, I call it a love story uh, and a mystery about connections made and lost. Uh, in It begins in 1962 in Pasadena, California with uh, Gracie Polanski, a quantum physics student uh, by day, uh, one of only two women in Caltech's physics program uh, at the time. And by night, she's a diner waitress secretly in love with Robert Jones, uh, a regular who uh, has Cary Grant's, you know, chin, uh, comes by every night uh, for pie and to hear about her day. Uh, but on the night that we meet him, he seems distracted. His mind is fixated, uh, as we know, on the suitcase uh, in the boot of his car, a suitcase full of mysterious and ominous purpose that he hopes uh, will set right uh, some mysterious, terrible thing he thinks that he's done to Gracie uh, and others. Uh, so uh, at the end of this this meeting between them, he tells Gracie he's leaving town for an indefinite period, and he hopes to see her again, uh, crushing her with those very specific words, uh, will she ever see him again? But the next night, uh, he returns, uh, except this time, he doesn't remember who she is. And then the FBI burst in with their guns waving, accusing him of blowing up Pasadena City Hall and killing the 23 people inside it. Uh, Jones doesn't remember doing any of this either. 
Uh, and so in short order, uh, the Gracie ends up on the run uh, with Jones, a man who may or may not be a terrorist, a mass murdering terrorist. Uh, and as the two of them make their way across the American Southwest and eventually much further um, uh, trying to work out whether Jones really is this bomber uh, and falling in love uh, all over again. Uh, their story begins to interweave with numerous other stories taking place uh, across time. Uh, and some of the characters that that we meet uh, include an identity shifting rock star who knows a, a terrible secret, uh, an artist in post-revolutionary France whose paintings seem to drive people insane, uh, there's an astronaut lost in space, a married pair of Nazi hunters uh, slowly breaking up as they they murder Nazis across the world, uh, a samurai trying to keep his son safe from a one-armed assassin, two screenwriters in Hollywood whose passion project uh, might be reshaping uh, reality in some way, uh, and, and many more. Uh, ultimately, uh, Gracie and Joan's story will reveal how we are all interconnected across space and time uh, by love, grief, uh, and something like quantum entanglement. So it, it's, a, it's a small book, as I like to <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that when we normally ask authors to pitch their books, it's it's a sort of stuttering, oh, it's about this sort of thing. But I suspect that your time in Hollywood has, has helped you manage, yeah. you know, you get a meeting, you have to pitch it in, in clear detail to someone. I, I've become very accustomed to pitching it, but also this book is very sprawling and complicated and it took a lot of work to work out how to describe it without rambling for five minutes. That was the... <laughs> I knew that was the danger that if you asked me that, I'd just go on for five minutes. And at the end of it, you'd ha still have no idea what the hell I was talking. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm currently reading it and it is, it's fantastic. And uh, the opening, oh, thank you. The, the opening scene in the diner stuff is a really grabbing open, really grabby opening. It's, it, it's great. And, and I kind of wondered, you know, where does, what's your process? Where did you get your idea from? You know, what, was it fully formed? Did you, research stuff? Do you read articles and pulpits together? What's your process? Mm. Well, this book uh, in particular involved a lot of research uh, that often just evolved out of things I was passionate about. Uh, it, it was a book in many ways, I think, that wrote itself uh, the way that it, it came together. I knew the central storyline of, of Gracie and Jones from the start. It was an idea that I pitched as a film eight or nine years ago. Uh, and it was a much smaller idea uh, at that point. Uh, but around it, I had collected just books and books, you know, notebooks of uh, notes about paintings I had seen that had evoked certain feelings, uh, bits of history that I had picked up uh, from travels. I, I love to travel. I, I read a ridiculous amount of philosophy. Uh, and a, a lot of the book is having a conversation with pop culture, which is just something I'm passionate about uh, in a sort of academic way. Uh, so I, I just I, I I was my own Wikipedia uh, at that point in terms of the these elements I wanted to, uh, to weave in, uh, at least regard with regard to the uh, regards to the uh, the research aspect of it. So that that was the starting point. <laughs> And and when you when you wrote this uh, as a novel, did you have a literary agent, or did you find one after after you'd written it? I found one afterward. I wrote it from a place of passion. Uh, I actually was largely convinced nobody would want to read it uh, when I started it. It just was something I needed to do. Uh, I finished about 80 pages and an author friend of mine uh, discouraged me from thinking that it was just sort of uh, straightforward science fiction. Uh, and and at that point, I, I, I think I began to amass more and more confidence about what was happening as I, I worked, uh, mostly because the book, again, seemed to be writing itself. It felt like it it almost uh, existed uh, outside of me. And I was just kind of trying to to rein in something that was uh, outside of my control. Uh, so by the time it was done, uh, I shared it with a few people, received some incredibly positive feedback. Uh, Nicholas Meyer, who, who did a blurb for the book, uh, wrote and directed Star Trek II and numerous other films, uh, was, was very encouraging. Uh, and so at that point I shared it with my 
uh, my film TV agents in the UK, uh, they both read it incredibly quickly, despite the fact that it was 600 pages in Word, uh, and uh, and fell in love with it. Uh, again, surprising, <laughs> mostly because I just didn't really think this would lead anywhere. Uh, and uh, and and they found me an agent uh, uh, within a few months that I hit it off with that that gave me notes that were so precise they were actionable without being intimidating but also transformative mm -hmm. uh to the book uh and i think it's it's chances in the market in terms of those notes i mean is that a very different process to what you get in hollywood where from what we understand from speaking with other people as well you get um you know notes from 20 different people saying contradictory things essentially yeah. Oh no, I'm very accustomed to that. Uh, this is this is very different because I I find that Hollywood notes are largely prescriptive, whether they say that or not. You'll you'll hear things like, "Oh, this is the bad note," or "This is here. Let me pitch you this bad idea." But what that <laughs> generally means is, "Why don't you do what I'm telling you, and we'll all be happier if you just stop disagreeing about it." And not that it often doesn't lead to something interesting. Uh, but when you have three different people often giving different notes about what you have to do to make them happy and suddenly you have a scene that was half a page that's now four pages long and and everything that was good about it is out the window, you realize it's a, it's a generally lousy system. Uh, the, the notes for the novel were much more similar to what I experienced working in the UK TV industry, uh, which they're... They were precise, but they were more interrogative. They they were about asking me, they asked me questions to, to illustrate a concern that he didn't know the answer to. He just wanted me to understand his concern and allowed me to find the solution mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day. And so that it's a it's a, a, a huge difference to just trust that your the artist that you're working with, the writer that you're working with is going to find an, a solution that's true to them and, and probably more interesting than whatever you know, sort of lazy macro notes that would make it a more commercial book or, mm -hmm. or tick this box for readers. Uh, yeah. It just, it produced a much better outcome, at least in whether or not anybody else actually loves the book it made me love the book more. And, and for, for me, that's what mattered. I mean, it, it certainly sounds like after your experience with, with in the film industry and stuff, and then with the whole Trump and Brexit, et cetera, that writing this was almost like a kind of therapy. It sounds like it was a, a real, it, it wasn't a, 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 I want to write a book and sell a book to, to make money. It was that I need to write this to, for myself. I, I actually don't know how to write long form fiction uh, that that isn't therapy in some way in this regard i mean the, the title of the book sounds for the end of the world it it really wa was about writing it was about this anxiety about the world and and this sense that i i feel most people have that this can't actually go on this is all going to the party's over soon right uh, <laughs> uh and oh shit i have kids what the hell uh uh, what does that mean for them? Uh, how, how can any of this remotely be solved uh, while there there seems to be, uh, and I know it's social media magnifying a lot of it, but whatever hope we had that, that barbarism uh, had been replaced by any aspiration for decency seems to have, have completely gone out the window. And so Th this was that it was just some way to remind myself that there was something to hope for in the world that there was still beauty left to to care about and and does your process because obviously writing a book takes a lot longer than a screenplay or that or at least a, a draft of a screenplay normally mm. and does your process in actually writing your mechanical process in terms of day-to-day -day writing change at all when you're when you're writing long-form fiction as opposed to a screenplay oh, that's a good question i i find that in general i can't write a single thing for more than four to six hours a day so i always need another project to complement it in some way and and um i guess creatively stimulate me uh in the the case of psalms my wife had just given birth so the first 
five, six months, I was writing it from three to seven in the morning. And then I'd get a couple hours later in the day after I, I woke up from another nap. Uh, and that was written alongside, a, I was writing a, a film for Park Sham Wook at that time. So it was just feeding back and forth. Uh, but but my my process is, uh, is, it's not fancy. I just, I write, I, I, these days I wake up and I start writing usually from five to seven. Yeah. I write from five to seven. Then I write from nine to five with a couple breaks for some walks and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, but I just write and don't really think about, uh, what I do in that time. And I, I just trust it's all going to work out in the end. And you you said earlier on that that sort of early process as a, as a journalist kind of taught you, I suppose, the discipline of just mm. writing and just getting it done. Because I think, you know, certainly for writers starting out, whether it's screenplays, whether it's uh, novels or whatever, there can be a tendency to, you know, wait for the right moment or overthink parts and take days off while you try and work, work your way through a a difficult point and things like that but the, the the actual habit of writing is quite an important thing I think I think uh, th there's no judgment that comes from me when it when it comes to how people choose to write some people need to create that uh, a, a very specific dynamic that that it's, it's different for everybody. Some people need to comport to some sense of these classic writers. And I write from 10 until two in the morning. That's that's when my magic happens. Or I only write from four until seven and everything else in the day is terrible. I I, it, I, I just know that. It's, oh, well, you know, that if that's what works for you. Uh, and for me, it's it's ritual. I don't, I get nervous if I'm not writing. I go on, on holiday. Uh, I still have to write two hours in the morning. And if, if I'm in France in a museum, I'm, I'm writing things down these days, often just talking into Siri. <laughs> so she reminds <laughs> me later about whatever interesting thing uh, I just learned. And I'm, I, I snap photos of every single thing that I read on walls and, uh, and, and when I'm out, so I can look things up later as, as some sort of lazy note taking. Uh, and so that writing doesn't, for me, doesn't mean I'm, I'm literally typing for eight hours. Writing is often thinking. It's just being at peace with staring at an empty screen and knowing it's okay, it'll work out eventually because it it always seems to. I, that, that's the thing with screenplays. You're, you're contracted to turn things in in a certain time. And I've just worked out that if I have to write a 120 page screenplay and I sit down every day to write four pages, I'm going to be done two, three weeks early. Uh, it just... It's and if I can't write four pages a day, I probably shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And uh, and I just, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 I, I would have to quit at that point. And I mean, you, you kind of mentioned it, it just there, but it sounds like you've, you, although you've obviously really enjoyed writing this book, you've not given up your screenwriting work as well. And you've you've written Park Chan Wook, uh, Genocide of mm -hmm. Oregon, I think is the film that you were working on with him and you're doing a rock musical with Dave Stewart I mean it sounds like you've still got these exciting passion kind of projects on the go in the script world as well I I do and some th those are our projects that I think are a little bit further along where where producers are off trying to now make them happen uh that that's always the the painful part will will you have a film out of it or do you just have a, a paycheck or direct deposit, which is now, uh, except for in the States, I keep getting checks there. I don't understand why. <laughs> it's really problematic. I live in Australia and I have to have family members deposit checks. And <laughs> it, it's just such a pain in the ass. Like they send me photos of checks that then I have to deposit on my computer screen <laughs> taking photos. To, it's, it's such nonsense. It's such a backwards place. Uh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, no, I've, 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 I've recently sold a couple more projects in uh, the UK, uh, a, a television and uh, a television pilot, at least in a film. And I'm writing on the second series of a, a, a show called Tropo uh, over here in Australia, starring uh, my friend Tom Jane. Uh, so it's, you know, some of them are are the passion projects that, that you fight for. Uh, some 
are just because they excite you. I, 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 I enjoyed the series Tropo, but I hadn't been able to work on a crime series before. I was actually in, in the speaking with the the head writer yesterday uh, because I was I was brought on after the the room started, uh, and and it was strange because we're discussing a scene that is so cliche at this point. You see it in every sort of crime series, uh, and I won't describe it specifically, but it it uh, it's something that everybody I feel like has written, but it's not only the type of thing that you do after the first episode. So the first episode, you would rarely see the scene. And because I've I've primarily written pilots in the crime <laughs> space, I had never been able to do this incredibly mundane thing before. Uh, and it was startling how 15 years into writing, uh, I, I reached a, a 110 year old cinematic trope and thought, well, I, I, this is new. What, what, <laughs> what the hell is this thing? Like, I, I have no idea how to make uh, make such a a boring scene interesting. Uh, and and it was it was a challenge simply because I was writing in the middle of an, a season instead of uh, a pilot. That's a long winded and weird sort of little detail, but but there's a huge difference between writing pilots and writing those mm -hmm. first episodes to launch a series and what happens in the middle of a, a of a series it sounds as well like when we have authors on whether they're crime writers or fantasy writers or whatever they often tend to write in the same genre they tend to you know whether by choice or not sometimes it's a sort of publisher saying no you need to, your next book needs to be another crime book or whatever um mm. Whereas being a screenwriter, while there's this, it's a, you know, whilst the churn of like writing stuff that isn't getting produced and stuff, mm. you seem to be able to write across a much more diverse range of areas. I'm fortunate because in Hollywood they like to put you in boxes, and that's part of what what broke me. The fact that I had I went 11, 12 projects mm -hmm. that were just rebooting my childhood one after another. You know, and it's not that I didn't care about them; I invested in them, but it 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 wasn't the same as is projects I pursued uh, after that. But when I left Los Angeles, I was still working there, but but then I moved to the UK, and suddenly there was this new pool that I was swimming around in that I got to uh to to write in and with that came Europe I I started working in Italy and that that was a, a different flavor uh of narrative and what what you could and couldn't do what they were excited about and now I'm in Australia and I'm still working in all of these places so what I found is whatever I want to do there's somebody somewhere mm -hmm. who will let me tell that story yeah. so if it's not commercial enough for the states that's okay the UK loves small character driven uh projects that that aren't wrapped up in in some high concept they just want you know interesting character moments you know, great there's there's an outlet there or uh you, know, you, you want something that feels very operatic uh Italy's right there you know it's it it, it might be interested in that that sort of heightened uh but but very stylized madness so th i think that's i think a lot of writers would be broader in there they or screenwriters would would do more but a lot of times you're you're working within a environment that tells you that you can't if you want mm -hmm. to keep selling and i think that fiction ends up being the same thing you uh uh it's a slower process to evolve away from wherever you are uh, I've I've written a second book, uh, which I wish I could talk about, but I you know I, I, I can't. It's but it's it's existentially similar, uh, and it, there are certain aspects that are similar, but it's also pivoted just that sort of fifteen percent. So maybe by the fourth book, I could be doing something that is straight drama versus something that has more speculative aspect or mm -hmm. some sort of heightened you know genre aspect in there and it's not that i don't love those genre aspects but if i just turned around uh uh you know a straight literary fiction book uh, as my second book it uh, it would be like i was going out into the market for the first time mm -hmm. uh but i would have lost that luster of being a a, a debut novelist uh so I, I would have handicapped myself in every possible yeah. way so it's just do you want to spend eight years evolving <laughs> into a a new type of book. I'm patient. It's, it doesn't have to be my primary 
uh, income as it as it has to be for others. Yeah. So 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 what's next then? You've you've mentioned a few scripts that you've written, which are kind of in the in the producing pipeline. You've got a second book, which you've finished writing. Have you have you got more books, more scripts you're working on that you can talk about? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I guess you would call it polishing at this point, the second novel, and I have an idea. Uh, I, I've been outlining the third, uh, and uh, and each of those, their they're evolutions sort of shifts uh, uh, away from, I mean, Psalms is it's uncategorizable. It doesn't, it's, it's so broad, there's chapters that are romantic comedies for all intents and purposes, and, and others that are in uh, as intensely violent as in Inglorious Bastards or any other Tarantino film, so it's a lot of things. These others, I think, I'm 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 trying to be a little bit more focused, uh, and and perhaps not write such large books, mostly because I do like getting to the ending and finding out how how something ends. <laughs> uh, and then uh, on the the featured television side, I'm just working on on these projects and trying to find things that that are interesting uh, a lot of you know, the market is unstable at the moment we have a, the writers guild strike is happening in the states and that's likely going to go on for for still several uh months and so it's a it's a strange market uh to to navigate at the moment uh so yeah i write some fiction write some television when when people let me and uh and and write some strange essays you know, personal essays and write about film and tv and and other art uh on substack that that seems to be my five to seven a.m uh <laughs> <laughs> output at the at the, at the moment uh, with with screenplays uh, one thing i want to ask was obviously once you are known as a screenwriter you will get commissioned to do certain to work on certain projects and things like that but so does the idea of writing something completely speculative in terms of like you've not been commissioned for it and you want to pitch it to people, does that sort of fall away and it becomes all about the commissions that you're getting or are you still pitching ideas to people? Uh, well, commissions for me generally come from pitching ideas. The speculative right. work, I, I've i written in the last five years a few and, the, and they tend to be much more passion projects uh, and uh, I think the last couple, they, they, it, it's a strange thing. My experience is that specs, for the most part, get me work elsewhere. Right. Uh, and I've sold three or four, but but they tend to define me in people's minds in some way they haven't thought about me before or introduce me to entirely new people. You know, oh, look, he, he writes small period character dramas uh, you know, set in the middle of World War II with two locations. I didn't know that about him. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. And so there, I, I, I think my problem with specs is that I view them like I do novels. I write them for myself mm -hmm. and then that gets me work elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just there too, like, I, I, I think I write really ambitious uh scripts that that in the in that space that i probably if i were a wiser writer would uh <laughs> would do something maybe a little bit more commercial rather than <laughs> than uh, intriguing and i suppose with screenplays as well you have to uh, or or to heighten the chance of them being made i suppose there, there there are things that you have to think about like budget and things like that you know how much will it cost to have 20 helicopters in this scene as opposed to in a book you can throw in as many as you want kind of a thing no absolutely i i think i i probably have six or seven times as many locations as the the biggest james bond film ever made yeah. uh, in the novel and i have that freedom and i can jump forward and backward in time and uh in hollywood you you can literally do a um a parlor drama set in 1820 with three bedrooms and still hear how well it's period. You don't, you don't understand how expensive that is. That's a $40 million movie. And you say, but the Brits just do it for 6 million. Uh, <laughs> why, why would it cost that much? And you realize in their minds, they're thinking, Oh, Tom Hanks is going to be one of the characters. So you know, <laughs> you have to work in that, that budget to justify making this film. Uh, so it's uh, you, 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 um, you're handicapped, I guess, by that uh, a bit. But my problem, as I said, is is I when I write a spec, 
I think that that spec, because people know it's just mine, it's, it's sort of, it's a statement that this is me and that isn't necessarily commercial. And, and as I said, a wiser writer who was interested in just selling, uh, and I'm not that I'm not interested in selling things, but I feel like I've never quite acquired that, 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 that sense of self-preservation that would let me just write something. <laughs> yeah. A little more obvious. A cool head in Marvel movie is unlikely, then perhaps. I not no to, to be. Fair, I would enjoy that immensely, but I feel like the process would also break me, and <laughs> and so it's it, because I I don't know how, what how you do something truly interesting in that space with that many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe it works. I I don't know, but the way I work. I feel like I would just end up pissing everybody off. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. You see these kind of like Marvel is a kind of big, massive machine. And mm. especially as time's going on, it's, they've gotten quite same, you know, very similar types of feeling in every movie and stuff. And then you kind of every so often you get something like a WandaVision or something, which is really different. And, and you think, how did that manage to get through the churn and, and, and go kind of crazy and, and get the sign off from the upstairs rather than getting it hammered down to make it like everything else what what's fascinating about marvel at least how i break it down is that the, their television series are all now wildly ambitious like mm -hmm. the movies used to be and the movies are increasingly homogenous because mm -hmm. you're you're you can't take those risks with the budgets and the ip and what you know what's at stake and so it's uh, it it seems for me, I, I still go to them, go to every one of them. I, I, I enjoy them, uh, but they seem safer, you know, yeah. whereas Iron Man felt daring, you know, I, I'm not a great fan of Iron Man three, but Iron Man three had a lot of opinions. You know, yeah, there you were... can't imagine Iron Man three being made now. It feels very different than the rest of the. Yes. Of yes. Movie. And they still sometimes, I mean, they, they let Taika, do some amazing stuff and and james gunn's now left uh so hopefully somebody else steps in and it's it's not that these don't have a personality but eventually there, there just seems to be an element of safety that mm -hmm. that uh the tv series don't have where they're literally blowing up form every single and yeah some of them are more conventional like like uh, uh Captain America and Winter uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, uh, but uh, you know most of them are still just doing something really, really groundbreaking, and which it, I enjoy. It, it's interesting though that the that the sorry this has turned into a Marvel chat, but um, yes. it it, right. it it's interesting that the that as these films become safer and more homogenous, as you say, that they're actually lose it you know they're not making these the huge amounts of money that they were previously when they did take more risks with the films mm. so so you know and the series are getting more praise and all this sort of stuff so you know there is this balance that they don't seem to quite strike and i get it with the terms of the budget of the movies is obviously much higher and things like that but sometimes taking those risks can pay off i think I, I feel like much of this is still beyond my pay grade, as I, I sometimes describe it. How do you make the decisions about films this large if they're all breaking the mold? I mean, the, uh, well, the, the, the Eternals, I think, did that. It tried something very yeah, ambitious yeah. and people, a lot of people didn't like it. <laughs> so I'm glad it existed because it felt uh so distinct uh from everything else but Absolutely, yeah. people don't show up and what do you what do you do about that so i don't know how they make those those decisions but also that as the films progress they don't there there are so many of them they inherently the story doesn't feel as focused i think it's it's not as easy for the audience to understand what they're showing up for with each film yeah uh, you know, what what am I investing in in some way? What it's sort of like you read a good novel and there's a chapter, maybe a couple chapters. You're like, yeah, what? I mean, this isn't that great, but you know, it's going to get back to something really exciting. I don't care about this character, uh, and and you you could feel that way about um, mm -hmm. Marvel for a while, and and that's becoming a little bit blurred because 
uh, as as they all as many of them can feel that that I guess flattened in some way. Yeah. Uh, you you find yourself waiting for the next one yeah. more yeah. often yeah, because I it's just it's a statistical game. You can't make that many and have and, and pull off yeah. the same statistics before where you go, oh, Thor two, that was you know, and then <laughs> And and and, and to, be, to be fair to Thor too, it was also redeemed in Endgame, uh, which somehow <laughs> retroactively made me uh, made me love that film uh, in, in some way that I didn't, didn't before. But you could you could have a favorite, and you could have one that utterly disappointed you, and you just didn't care. And it's yeah. it's it's more problematic when it's one in three that are making you want to come back twice, and the other two you're like ah. Yeah, you know, watch that plus. Yeah, it definitely yeah. feels like the kind of the 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 march to to end game was a real focused. Every mm. ch- chapter was building the narrative up, and you're and you had this moment of they were they're all going to be in it. They're all going to be together. It was mm. exciting, and I think ever since then it's difficult to capture that kind of zeitgeist moment. And it's it does feel a bit floundery. I think the last phase. I I think some of this is inherent in the the loss of the infinity stones in the series because you had a a, a, a detail you had something that glued every single one of the films together and that's a little nebulous at the moment and maybe by the time they do pull it off we'll go back and look at all those earlier films and say oh that's how it all all worked uh but but that it, it's it is I think lacking a bit of the excitement at the moment that the TV series have in yeah. Yeah. space. Yeah. Every time there's a new TV series, uh, I think, oh my God, wait, Hawkeye, really? I, oh, <laughs> you did a Hawkeye Christmas series? I get to watch every year. I did. I did not see that coming. Now I, uh, I, I want Hawkeye as my 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 Christmas comedy every year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What was the last book that you read? Um, I th- I've been re- my problem is I'm reading three simultaneously right now, and this is dragged out uh, for uh, uh, three months. So I think the last one that I closed uh, was I reread How High We Go in the Dark uh, and also Scary Monsters, which is probably less of an internationally known book. Uh, but is by Michelle de Kretzmer. It's uh she's a an Australian writer, uh, author, and and it's quite a brilliant, very ambitious uh, book in terms of of its form. But in how high we go in the dark, if you haven't read it, is uh, by Sequoia Nagamatsu, and it's it's just phenomenal. I read it twice uh, over the course of 13, 14 months because it, it was just such a, a sort of spectacular trip through grief and uh, uh it's, a, it's a, an accidental allegory for covid uh which is which is also wonderful nice um what about the last film that you watched uh oh these, these it, it's it's a i have to go through recall now um what uh this was too oh it was the last one was actually ant-man and wasp Quantumania. Uh, <laughs> speaking of, of of Marvel films, but then uh, probably uh, something I was I, I I had a lot of fun. I right before that I, I watched uh, fifth or sixth time uh, in American in Paris with Gene Kelly, which uh, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, uh, Minnelli musicals of of his. Excellent. And uh, what about the TV show that you last watched or are watching? Yeah, uh, well, we're, we're like almost everybody. I'm I'm uh, sort of working my way through the last episode or two of of Ted Lasso in succession. Uh, so that that's been uh, been uh, a, a lot of uh, fun, uh, and I'm in the middle of watching Barry uh, as well. Uh, its final season. I I, I find that uh, uh, I. I'm in a period over the last month or two where all of these series that have taken up a lot of my life are going away. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Picard, which is actually that I think Picard is my favorite series of uh, Picard series three, the, my favorite series of 2023. Um, uh, but but all of these, except maybe Picard, went on too long. <laughs> I love yeah. them, but it's just like, like I'm, I'm just I, I don't have time in my life. Yeah. to to watch seasons for four and five seasons uh, or or watch a com a sitcom that now is an hour and five minutes every episode uh and i love them i do uh but it's just it's exhausting trying to get through them all so i'm i'm, I'm both enjoying the the sort of last moments of these uh and mourning them at the same time and incredibly grateful that I can go watch some new television now. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the jump in quality in from season one, two to three, three of Picard was uh, was insane. I thought first two, I thought yeah, was, it, it, was and good, it, three was brilliant. It, it's uh, I I know too many behind the scenes stories, but my friend wrote on two and three, and and uh, Terry Metalis, who's the showrunner on three, came in late on two and and did his best, I think, to to save that and then was allowed uh to uh, to to do this with three and it's it's phenomenal I, I think it's the best trek that that's happened since uh first contact and uh yeah, agree with that, yeah. yeah it's just so so damn good <laughs> well the, the 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 very the very last that we do is a super quick fire either or and uh I would say there's no right answers here apart from perhaps one of them. But we'll start off with uh, screenwriting or novel writing. That is a question for the day. For, for, <laughs> for that changes by the day. But for the most part, I do think if I think novels, if I think I would be quite happy just being paid to sit and write novels for the rest of my life and uh and then go drink with my friends that uh that that would be an incredibly low stress but incredibly satisfying life a uh, tv or cinema cinema every time i mean that's not even a debate <laughs> <laughs> night owl or early bird sorry what was that night owl or early bird night owl um music or no music when you're writing uh that depends on the project so that's that's, that's a hard one but generally no music uh, i also have, I have to say you said night owl but you also get up at 5 a.m yeah, so i mean this is a young kids brutal a yeah <laughs> uh yeah yeah it's uh i i do i do uh i but that's it's, it's funny because i identify as that but i know i'm not and so <laughs> it's Maybe it's just the part of of having children. I you 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 constantly. I don't know if you have kids, but you mourn who you were, and it, it's your identity is. I'm supposed to watch movies until twelve, one o'clock, and realistically, I'm now the person who go who who turns on episode nine of uh, Succession and goes hour and fifteen minutes. Like that. <laughs> 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 Going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> What was that extra 15, 20 minutes for? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. I, didn't I actually time had that. that I actually had that night. exact same thought last night when we watched episode nine. I was like, it's getting longer and longer these episodes. Yeah, no, it's it's again. I love Ted Lasso, but I I, I turn it on and I I think oh, I'm going to watch a, a a sitcom and I'll, we'll watch a couple episodes tonight. And then I realize I, I just watched a, a, a movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the very very last one is real book or ebook. Oh, real book i i mean buy my ebook but, <laughs> but but uh but yeah no i i love pages and i i i want a library that i'm I, not that you want all of these answers but I, books are they tell your story in some way you know you i i write in mine and 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 dog ear them and and highlight things that are beautiful and so was they throwing up I, his mouth I, just I, now. Sorry, it's stressing me out. That no, I, I like to, I, I love books, but I, I like to keep them as pristine, as pristine as possible. Yes, I, but that's you also can have your own relationship with them. But it's amazing. I can open up a book I haven't read for twenty five years and then find the receipt uh, for where <laughs> yeah, I bought yeah, it from. That's right. Uh, in the book, reminding me, oh, you were living in, uh, you know, in in Ann Arbor, and you bought yeah. this from Little Drum, I, and mm -hmm. suddenly I'm I'm back in two thousand two, and uh, I. 
I value that. I, I'm, I'm sure there's some some element in the ebook that I could look in. Oh, when did you buy this? But it's just yeah, it's no, it's not the same. Not the same. I agree. <laughs> also, when the world ends in a few years, I feel like the ebooks are going to be useless. But also, yeah, once once the internet dies off, we'll be yeah, <laughs> we burn the books for for heat. So we'll be <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> That's... Just, just a deteriorating situation. First the ebook goes, <laughs> then my library becomes kindling. <laughs> well, a man after my Jean Luc Hart, Picard season three. Uh, I would totally agree with that. Cool, it's of the best trek this side of First Contact. I think. Yeah, yeah I've, I've still to watch it. I'm too scarred by season one, which was pretty <laughs> well, bad. I mean, and I heard season two <laughs> yeah. was awful. If you were so. scarred by season one, season two will finish you off. It's yeah. dreadful. But season three was... I think yeah. I'll just give it, I'll skip season two. Just, <laughs> As we've, we've, we've said before, it's it's season three has that kind of, you know, pure uh, fan... What's the nostalgia word? Fan nostalgia. Type. Just like pure... Yeah. It, it plays, fan service. Fan yeah. service is the word I'm looking for. It plays right into that. And, and, and early on, I was like, oh, this is maybe a bit too much. This is maybe a bit kind of cringy. I don't know. And then I was like, you're being stupid. Just embrace it. And as soon as you embrace it, it's just like, I want more. Get fit in more references and more <laughs> music and more. It's just, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. It's the perfect antidote for folk like me who have been a bit jaded with new Trek and uh, and just want to, to rewatch old Trek. It's the perfect. <laughs> yeah, antidote, exactly. Yeah, don't want new things. <laughs> yeah, just you're you're everything that's wrong. I am. I'm a huge problem. Repackage what was <laughs> yeah. old. Just don't change it. The industry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but thanks very much to Cole for coming coming on to the podcast. It was a really interesting chat and obviously really interesting hearing about the differences in working in Hollywood compared even to the UK film industry and then obviously working in novels as well. Um, and I'm glad that the experience from Dracula didn't break him <laughs> yeah. to the extent that he doesn't want to work in the industry anymore. He's obviously got the film with Park Chan Wook coming out and he's still working in other stuff. Um, and... You know, I can totally see working for network TV on a show that is that you've sort of been brought on to is going to be totally different to writing your own sort of script yes. for a feature Absolutely. film or something like that. Although I'm sure that has its own share of issues as, as well. Um, but yeah, uh, Sam's for the End of the World is out now in paperback and we'll put a link to the podcast in the podcast description so you can pick that up. And uh, we won't be back next week. We're taking a short two-week break uh, just to recharge the batteries, give me a chance to edit things. Uh, we have got already a number of brilliant authors in the in the can, as they say, but we're just taking two weeks off. But there will be an episode of Page One Extra in the meantime, so you don't need to miss us too much. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do take the time to rate and review us on your favourite podcast app. It really helps us grow the podcast and continue to get great guests on the podcast. And if you want to get in touch, you can always send us, well, there's a number of ways now you can get in touch, uh, uh, an email, which is uh, podcast at rightgear.co.uk or a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one. You can find us on Mastodon, which is writing.exchange forward slash at page one pod. Or you can go into YouTube where we are uh, youtube.com forward slash at page one podcast. It's everything. Yeah, and you can leave a comment under the yes. video of whatever episode you want to discuss, which is great. So, uh, otherwise, hope you have a great couple of weeks while we take our short break. But do tune in to our Page One Extra episode, uh, which I think you'll find interesting. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another brilliant guest. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button. And be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm -hmm.